Hello everyone. This is online lecture 4 of the course Network Control Systems. Today's title is Control Based on Distributed Optimization. First, let's overview a recent trend of distributed optimization in systems and control. After 2000s, a close link has been found between gradient algorithm for convex optimization and passivity of dynamical system. This is an illustration of gradient algorithms of convex optimization. Here, the minimum value of a convex cost function is found by a gradient descent method. In fact, this update of optimization variable from an initial value to an optimal value can be regarded as a dynamical system. From such a viewpoint, a lot of papers discuss optimization algorithm design based on the tools from systems and control, especially based on the passivity. As you can easily find, Optimization is a key topic in the design and control of large-scale systems, such as urban traffic systems and power systems. As we will see in this lecture, the positive realness explained in the previous lectures can be understood as a frequency domain equivalent of passivity in the time domain. So let's review here the positive realness of transfer functions. In this slide, I introduce a detailed version of the definition of positive realness. First, we define the set of poles of Gs on the imaginary axis by this omega zero. Please note that this omega zero is empty if G is stable. Then, G is said to be positive real if these three conditions are satisfied. The first one corresponds to the stability of G, but we allow the existence of pure imaginary poles. The second one is the most essential condition that represents the positive realness of G. For SISO systems, this corresponds to the fact that the Nyquist curve of G is confined into the right half plane, as seen in the previous lectures. The third one seems complicated, but it is necessary to define the positive realness of G, which has some pure imaginary poles. For example, this condition is necessary to define the positive realness of the integrator which has the pole at the origin. This represents the fact that the residue matrix for the pure imaginary pole should be a positive semi-definite matrix like this. To see the definiteness of matrices, please look at this link. Next, we see a characterization of the positive realness in terms of the state space realization in the time domain. This lemma is known as positive real lemma in system and control. Let sigma be a minimal realization of a square stable transfer matrix G denoted by the matrices A, B, C, and D. Here, the term square means that G is a square matrix which has the same numbers of inputs and outputs. Then, G is positive real if and only if there exists some positive definite matrix P such that this linear matrix in inequality holds. This lemma states that the positive realness of G can be determined by finding a solution P to this LMI which is written by the matrices A, B, C, D in the state space form. If you are not familiar with the state space realization of transfer matrices, please look at this link. This time domain characterization will be used in this lecture. 
Okay, let's move on the explanation of passivity. Because the passivity is valid for not only linear systems, but also nonlinear systems, we introduce it for nonlinear systems. A nonlinear system sigma here is set to be passive if there exists a positive definite function wx such that w0 is 0 and the time derivative of w along the trajectory of sigma is bounded by the inner product of the input and output like this for any input signal u. Here, a positive definite function is a function such that its values are all positive except at the origin. This function w is often called a storage function that represents the amount of energy stored in the system. So, its time derivative here corresponds to a stored power, which is bounded by the power provided by the external input u. In particular, sigma is said to be output strictly passive if there additionally exists a positive constant rho such that this strict version of the inequality holds. Clearly, if sigma is strictly passive in this sense, then it is passive as well. Then, let's see here why passivity is useful in system analysis and synthesis. In short, Passivity is a useful modular property such that the negative feedback interconnection of two passive systems is again a passive system. So, if we can identify the passivity of each subsystem in a modular fashion, then we can automatically guarantee the passivity of their interconnected system, which is to be stable. This fact is formally stated as this theorem, which is often called passivity theorem. For this negative feedback system, if each subsystem sigma i is passive with respect to its input-output pair vi, yi, then the negative feedback system is passive with respect to input u1 and out of the y1 of the feedback system. In particular, if this sigma1 is output strictly passive, then so is the negative feedback system here, as stated in the second part of this theorem. In fact, the basic principle of the passivity theorem is very simple. This simplicity is actually one reason why a passivity approach is often taken in systems and control. Suppose that both sigma1 and sigma2 are passive such that these dissipation inequalities hold. Then let's sum up these two inequalities and then we have this inequality. Please note that this is written in terms of v1y1 and v2y2. So, we substitute these relations about v1 and v2, which represent the interconnection of sigma1 and sigma2, and then we have this inequality. This clearly shows that the function w1 plus W2 is a new storage function of the negative feedback system here. Furthermore, if we consider the case where u1 is equal to 0 here, then we see that this inequality represents that the time derivative of an energy function is non-positive. This means that this function w1 plus w2 can be used as a Lyapunov function to prove the stability of the feedback system. Next, let's go back to the positive realness. As I said in the previous slide, the passivity in the time domain is equivalent to the positive realness in the frequency domain for linear systems. 
In particular, as proven by a special case of well-known KYP lemma, the passivity here is equivalent to the positive realness here, which corresponds to the right half plane for the Nyquist curve of GS. Furthermore, the out of the strict passivity corresponds to the disk in the right half plane with a radius of low inverse. It is clear that this disk domain is a subset of the right half plane here. In fact, the positive definite matrix P in the positive real lemma can give a storage function of linear passive systems. Let's consider a candidate of the storage function as a quadratic function like this. This is a positive definite function if P is positive definite. Then its time derivative along the trajectory of sigma is obtained as like this. This chain of equalities can be confirmed by a standard calculation. Thus, the dissipation inequality can be equivalently written for linear systems as this matrix inequality. It is clear that if this matrix is negative semi-definite for a positive definite solution P, which means that if G is positive real, then the system sigma is passive. Please note that the converse direction can also be proven, but its proof is not very easy to see. So far, we have seen the case where only two subsystems are interconnected. But the same idea can be applied also to the case of multiple subsystems. One possible way is to consider the feedback of subsystems block here and the interconnection block here. It is clear that if all subsystems sigma1, sigma2, sigma3 are passive and L is passive, then this negative feedback interconnection is stable. As in this figure, in terms of multi-agent systems, each subsystem sigma i can be regarded as an agent dynamics, and L is an interconnection rule among the agents. In particular, let's consider the case where each sigma i is a single integrator like this, and L is a graph Laplacian matrix denoted in blue here. Please note that these systems and the interconnection are passive or equivalently, they are positive real. Then the entire system dynamics is found as a consensus dynamics like this, and its stability can be proven by the passivity. Okay, I give here the today's homework to you. The task is to show that the second order oscillator network shown in this figure can be regarded as the interconnection of passive subsystems. In particular, let's consider how a subsystem dynamics sigma i and the interconnection L can be written as passive blocks like this. Some hints are provided in this slide. A possible way is to choose the subsystem sigma i as a single second order oscillator like this. In this case, the resultant interconnection is given like this. However, please note that this sigma i prime with input ui and output yi prime is not passive. So, this simple interpretation does not yield the interconnection of passive subsystems. Instead, let's consider the dynamics of this sigma i. Then, in fact, we can prove the passivity of this first order system. In your report, please write down a proof to show its passivity. Also, let's think about the resulting interconnection L and prove its passivity.
This is the today's homework. The remaining part of this lecture is on the convex optimization. In particular, we here think about an equality constrained convex optimization written like this. By a standard dualization technique called the method of Lagrange multipliers, we obtain the equivalent max mean problem, namely a saddle point problem, in which this red part is called a Lagrangian. Then, a primer dual gradient algorithm for this saddle point problem is written like this. Here, the update rule of the primer variable x is given as a gradient descent doing the minimization of the Lagrangian. While the update rule of the dual variable lambda is given as a gradient ascent doing the maximization. These differential equations can be written down as like this dynamics. In fact, it can be proven that this dynamics converge to the optimal primal dual solution denoted by x star and lambda star here. Please note that this dynamics is written as a continuous time dynamics, but a usual optimization algorithm, such as in operations research, is written as a discrete time dynamics for the numerical computation. The main objective in the following is to show the convergence of this dynamics using the notion of passivity. To discuss the convergence to non-zero equilibrium, we needed to modify the notion of passivity to an incremental version. Please note that the standard passivity can be used to show the stability of the equilibrium at the origin, but it cannot directly be used to prove the stability of non-zero equilibria. Here, I introduce the notion of equilibrium-independent passivity as an incremental version of standard passivity. To this end, for a nonlinear system sigma here, first, we define the set of all possible equilibria denoted by E sigma. This is a set of equilibria x star such that there is a corresponding steady state input U star. Then, sigma is set to be equilibrium independent passive if, for every x star, there exists a positive definite function wx star such that it passes through the origin and this incremental version of the dissipation inequality holds for any input u. Please note that the input u and the output y are considered as the increment from the corresponding steady state input and output. This definition seems complicated, but it can be interpreted as a standard passivity defined around every single steady state of interest. Then, using this incremental version of passivity, we can prove the stability of the prima dual gradient algorithm. By a simple calculation, we can rewrite the dynamics as a negative feedback interconnection of the subsystem sigma 1 1 and sigma 2. Then, in this system representation, we can prove that both sigma 1 and sigma 2 are equilibrium independent passive as stated in this theorem. So, the convergence to the optimal solution can be proven mathematically. In fact, to prove the passivity, the convexity of the function f plays an important role. As in this figure, 
A characterization of the convexity is given as the monotonicity of its gradient function. As seen in this slide, this monotonicity is the key to proving the passivity. Let's choose a candidate of the storage function like this quadratic function. Then its derivative is given as like this. Please note that using the steady state condition such that this blue part is zero, we add this redundant term for calculation. Then we have this equation. Here, the green term is found to be the output y1 minus y1 star like this. On the other hand, the monotonicity of gradient f guarantees that this red term is non-negative. This is because the monotonicity represents the fact that the positive increment of the variable x gives the positive increment of the function values, while the negative increment of the variable x gives the negative increment of the function values. This means that the increment of the variable x here times the increment of these function values here becomes always non-negative. Therefore, we obtain this inequality which shows the passivity of the system. Next, let's apply the primer dual gradient algorithm to this resource allocation program involving n players. Here, xi denotes the resource amount of player i and fi denotes its cost. The constant c here denotes the amount of the total resource to be allocated. Then, the Lagrange dual of this optimization can be written as like this. An important point here is that the minimization problem of each player is decoupled by introducing the dual variable lambda. The resultant dynamics is given as like this. Owing to the decoupled structure, the update of each xi can be done based only on the information of its own cost function fi and the lambda. The signal flow structure is shown in this figure. This blue coordinator performs the update of the dual variable lambda, which can be regarded as a price signal. Then each player updates the own variable xi according to the temporary price denoted by lambda t. As we can see here, the resource allocation problem here can be solved in a distributed manner using the method of Lagrange multipliers. Finally, just for reference, I explain the relation of the resource allocation problem and the microeconomics. Here, for simplicity, we consider the optimization with two players. In particular, player 1 is supposed to be a producer whose decision variable is positive, while player 2 is supposed to be a consumer whose decision variable is negative. Accordingly, the sign of the cost function is positive for producer while it is negative for consumer. The equality constraint of this optimization represents a supply-demand balance. Then, the Lagrange dual problem is given like this. Please note that the local optimization for each player highlighted by these red boxes is equivalent to the profit maximization at the price lambda. Here, the profit is defined as the income minus cost for the producer, while the outgo minus benefit for consumer. In fact, the optimal decision variables x1 star and x2 star, which are the function of lambda, 
corresponds to the supply curve of the producer and the demand curve of consumer. Therefore, the sum of them gives the supply demand curve here. The crossing point with the real axis gives the balancing price denoted by lambda star, by which the supply demand balance can be achieved. In fact, the monotonicity of all curves can be guaranteed by the convexity of cost functions. Therefore, the balancing price lambda star and the optimal supply and demand x1 star and x2 star are uniquely determined. Okay, this, the, this is the end of this lecture. Thank you for watching this video.